All right, everyone. I'm tired, and I didn't have a lot of time to make this one. I wrote the script, I recorded it, and I edited it all in the same day. But that doesn't mean it's going to be bad. I've done that before. This is obviously a really important episode, pitting two very important characters against one another. Naruto Uzumaki and Sasuke Uchiha. They haven't developed the same sort of friendship slash rivalry that we see in canon by this point. However, they've known each other for a while through other circumstances. And today we're going to see more precisely what those other circumstances entailed. Going forward, we should also be back to regularly scheduled programming. This Friday should be the release of the next episode, unless I get hit by a car or something. Last episode, we had Sasuke vs. Rock Lee. The outcome was as most suspected, but perhaps not in such a clear victory. The two ended up pretty evenly matched. Was Sasuke stubbornly sticking to Taijutsu when he could have won far faster with other types of jutsu? Did Rock Lee wait too long and lose his chance to activate that third gate? Would that have been enough? Today we're picking up right where we left off, at the start of the intermission, so that Sasuke has some time to rest. And we get to see some other characters interact in this time. Without further ado, let's jump in. With the excitement of Sasuke and Lee's match dying down, the competitor's balcony becomes quiet. Naruto feels a rumbling in his stomach, wondering if he should have eaten something today. But following the rumbling, a quiet, deep whisper echoes, ENSLAVED to a weakling. Shaking his head, Naruto tries to ignore the voice. Turning in place, his eyes wander to Gara, who leans up against a wall with arms crossed. The whisper comes again. That spineless Tanuki! Naruto can only guess that the Tanuki in question is the beast inside of Gara. But why would the fox have any disdain for a fellow tailed beast? If a tailed beast ever had an ally, would it not be another tailed beast? Yet the complete hatred bubbling from within was almost enough to turn Naruto's own mood. Not having to speak aloud, Naruto asks the fox a question in his head. Why does he hate the other beast? Instead of engaging in any kind of dialogue with Naruto, the fox withdraws, leaving only its most absolute negative emotions behind as a barrier. Naruto wonders why the fox didn't make a fuss during phase 2.5, but all he gets in response is further wailing negativity. The fox very rarely spoke directly to him before. This hearing each other was a new normal they both had to get used to. Eyes refocusing, Naruto looks at Gara's face and their eyes meet for a sparse few moments. Suddenly jostled from behind, Neji pulls Naruto's attention away from Gara. Naruto feels an odd pressure just from Neji's silent glare, and the tension is broken by the Hyuga. He tells Naruto that the Byakugan reveals all secrets, even when people think they are well hidden. His own clanmates were in the Anbu on special detail to follow Kushina around, because they were able to tell if the fox was about to get out of hand. Continuing, he asks if Naruto is going to hold back against Sasuke in spite of these secrets. Before Naruto even opens his mouth to respond, Neji demands that he bring everything he can muster against Sasuke. Neji points to Umoi and demands the same from their impending match. Neji will not tolerate those who are strong acting at anything less than 100%, even if that meant Neji or Sasuke would lose. Umoi sniffs derisively and ignores Neji. Naruto tells Neji that he doesn't know what he's talking about and turns to leave the room. As he passes by Gara, the latter whispers for him to bow to the beast. Staring at Gara and crooking his head, Naruto asks, what? Only to get silence as a response. Shrugging and sighing, Naruto shakes his head and continues on the long walk to the arena. Descending the long corridor to the arena below, the fox's whisperings find their way into Naruto's head again. This time, they're muffled, and he can't make out any of the words. Rolling his eyes, Naruto has to remind himself of the new expectations of his seal. While still working on him, the Master of Seals told him that the reinforcement seal that was causing weird influxes was going to be removed completely. But it has altered the Reaper Death Seal irreversibly. 
Whereas before, Naruto would only feel the fox's presence during spikes of great fear, the fox, going forward, would be ever-present. It wouldn't be in a state to allow the fox to take control, but if the fox was behind a wall before, it's easier to imagine that he's now behind a grate. Still stuck, but now it can see Naruto, speak to him, reach out to him. Those moments of heightened fear would still allow the fox control, but the rest of the time, it'd just be an annoying voice. The fox won't be able to affect Naruto's actions until an opening is presented. It will be up to Naruto's own strength of will to withstand its influence in these moments. If there's a positive out of all the negative, Naruto's chakra was mixing now more than ever with the fox's, allowing him to grasp beast chakra sometimes. Because tailed beasts are literally made of chakra, accessing the fox's power will also expose Naruto to its thoughts and memories. If the fox doesn't want to share, it can keep its hands out of the proverbial cookie jar, and then Naruto will be saner for it. The seal isn't technically weaker than before, so there is no immediate danger to Naruto at this time. Lord Orochimaru seemed more interested in the information than even his own dad, asking meticulous questions about the alterations to the Reaper Death Seal. Entering the arena at last, Naruto approaches Iruka, looking at the obviously still tired Sasuke. He's regained his breath, but the scratches across his body and clothes and forming bruises speak volumes to the damage Rock Lee dealt. Naruto also looks up at the silent crowd, scowling at their lack of applause, a courtesy they shared with all the other contestants. Even Gara got cheers. Far higher, Minato notices the crowd fall to a murmur and leans forward to look down at them, hoping there's a distraction that has silenced their spirit. Climbing to his feet, Sasuke studies what is a clearly uncomfortable Naruto, distracted by their observers. Echoing Neji, Sasuke tells Naruto to give it his all. Who cares about who's watching? There are three Kage and all the Sanin present. If the beast tries to get free, they'll shut it down quick. Naruto shakes his head at Sasuke and tells him he's never been afraid of the fox's freedom, as strange as that sounds. He doesn't want the fox to be free for the same reason as everyone else. However, it's the feeling of losing control of his own body while something else controls it that's terrifying. The feeling is so alienating that you lose your sense of who you are. You're not even a ghost of yourself, but just a collection of thoughts that own no identity. It's the worst feeling in the world, and it feels like you'll never regain control. It's horrible. And what's worse, he's alone in the feeling. No one else will ever know what that's like, except maybe the other hosts. But who knows if all their experiences are precisely identical. Not that it matters, outside Gara, Naruto will likely never meet another Jinshuriki to discuss this kind of stuff. Softening, Sasuke tells him that he himself is surrounded by blood relatives, but he lost his family years ago. He too is alone and there's no one that can seem to fill that void, even the Hokage, whose counsel he has sought countless times. So he tells Naruto to lighten up. Everyone has something to complain about. Instead, let's see how the son of the Hokage does against the Uchiha's prodigy. As the timer on the intermission ends, Iruka raises his arm and starts the match. Despite his weapon use and extensive taijutsu in the previous bout, Sasuke is still sharp enough to counter Naruto's attempts at a melee. He doesn't even need to use his Sharingan to counter Naruto's strikes, but it shocks him when Naruto successfully pulls Kunai from behind his back. It seems that he might have some tricks that might trick even the Sharingan, if only he didn't choreograph his attacks so clearly. Thrusting a high kick, Sasuke knocks Naruto into the air, but the latter recovers quickly, pulling several shuriken from his pack. Overwhelm him, Naruto hears over his shoulder, ignoring the voice. Forming a bird seal and a collection of others, Naruto chucks his shuriken, conjuring several wind shuriken amongst them. Even his Sharingan would be unable to see the wind shuriken if Sasuke had the knowledge of what Naruto had just done. Successfully deflecting the normal shuriken, Sasuke is still victim to the wind shuriken. 
However, at the range that they were thrown, Naruto hadn't held focus and they lost most of their edge. Though they cut Sasuke, they only do minor damage. Rolling away from the shuriken now stuck in the ground, Sasuke regains his posture and watches Naruto land. On week two of his training with Tsunade, she was still trickle-feeding him information about his parents as he reached certain milestones in his training. She told him that if he had even two more weeks with her, she could teach him some substantial jutsu. However, for just the tuning exams, she'll make sure he's sharp enough for even the toughest competitor. Muttering under her breath, Tsunade mentioned something about Genin and bets before refocusing on him. Continuing her story about his father, Tsunade reminds Sasuke that Fugaku was very slow to change his mind on the direction the village was heading in. Even after Minato made his impact on the battlefield known across the shinobi world, and it became obvious that he was in the running for Hokage, Fugaku did not lust for that power. He simply wished for someone else who wanted to change to be Hokage. Minato was almost 10 years younger than him, so Fugaku thought he'd be more open to said change. It calmed him. It couldn't have been six months before his family's massacre that Fugaku at last came to peace with the Uchiha's place in the village. However, it was too late. He was the leader of the Uchiha clan up until his death, and those feelings of injustice were seeded into lesser members of the clan. Even when Fugaku moved on, they did not. Meanwhile, his mother spent so much of her time at the Uzumaki household, it was uncanny that she had time to continue helping at the hospital. Sasuke's eye twitches and he quickly activates one of his captured jutsu with his Sharingan, the multi-clone genjutsu that he got from Sakura. Projecting himself at all sides of Naruto, he charges in and lands several easy, unguarded strikes on Naruto. Standing his ground, Naruto spins around and flails at the illusions uselessly. No real defense for even basic genjutsu. I can smell his wretched blood. The fox whispers as Naruto fixates suddenly on an area where none of the Sasuke illusions are. Diving at the space between them, Naruto collides with Sasuke and the genjutsu disrupts. Why was the fox actually trying to help him? Rolling on the ground, Sasuke sets a well-placed knee into Naruto's gut before throwing him free. Finding himself already panting, Sasuke is surprised that the fatigue would so quickly return to him after this basic combat so far. Tracing his chakra into his fists, Sasuke evens his breathing and attempts what Lady Tsunade warned him against, her taijutsu style. She taught it to him so he could figure out how to augment elements into his strikes. But thrusting with pure chakra would generate so much more physical force that if his chakra control isn't exactly on par, he could do serious damage to himself. Second guessing his decision, Sasuke wonders just how badly he wants to beat Naruto. Based on the only slight provocation Naruto had during phase 2.5, Sasuke was confident that it wouldn't take much prodding to force the fox out and disqualify Naruto. On the other hand, Sasuke also wasn't sure if he wanted to win in such an underhanded way. His indecision allows Naruto to initiate the next clash, throwing another volley of shuriken with wind shuriken. Sasuke wonders how small Naruto's bag of tricks is as he deflects the visible shuriken and dives out of the way to avoid the invisible. Wanting to buy more time, Sasuke conjures the multi-clone genjutsu again. Sakura's probably still got even more chakra control than he, but Sasuke admits that this jutsu is extremely easy for the minimal effort required. Smell it, you brat! He's right there! The fox whispers at Naruto, whose eyes lock again onto an empty space. This time, Naruto dives and hits nothing, colliding with the ground, and followed by sinister chuckling by the fox. <laughs> Naruto only had a few coherent days for training. He thought his dad would stick him with Jiraiya like he always did when it came to training. However, Lord Orochimaru scooped him up on one of his off days from the sealing rituals and brought him to his lab. Naruto assumed it was with permission from his dad since none of Lord Orochimaru's labs were within the city limits of Konoha. There were several traits that Naruto was picking up as a result of the sealing rituals. 
As more and more of the reinforcement seal got chipped away, his chakra control was incrementally increasing as well. In private, he'd been practicing the wind shuriken jutsu with varying success. Now though, with the reinforcement seal weakening, the wind shuriken was suddenly easy. Naruto found himself wanting more challenge and moved on to practicing the wind blade, but the step up in complexity was vast. Instead of training Naruto on something he just needed to practice, Orochimaru wanted him to realize the potential of being a Jinshuriki. Together with the Nara clan, Orochimaru was one of the key trainers for Kushina's Jinshuriki talents. Brows furling, Naruto shakes his head in confusion at why the Nara clan or Orochimaru were needed to train his mom. Lord Orochimaru tells Naruto that Beast Chakra is called such because it's distinctly different from normal chakra humans can access. And if there's one style of chakra that it's most similar to, it's Shadow Style. The two are intrinsically linked. This explains the difficulty for normal people to learn Shadow Style, let alone master it. But Jinchuriki have historically been able to master it due to their beast essentially being a part of them. In its efforts to screw with Naruto's success, the fox has unwittingly bled some of its chakra into Naruto's, allowing him to tap into its bestial techniques. Mimicking the fox in technique only, Naruto claps his hands together and brings form to the tailed beast chakra. The fox relays only disgusted emotion as Naruto wrests control of some of the beast's chakra. Instead of this chakra exuding from his person, Naruto's shadow expands from him before splitting into nine tendrils. Lifting from the ground like tentacles from the abyss, the nine chakra whips begin lashing out at Sasuke. Before he realizes what he's even looking at, Sasuke is set upon by their sudden offensive. While Naruto seems to need to be stationary for the technique, Sasuke also can't seem to reach him. Shuriken and kunai that are thrown are stopped by some of the whips, while others seek his ankles and wrists, and others seek to simply lash him. Studying the technique as Sasuke dodges the constantly following whips, he attempts to steal the jutsu. Sasuke's tomo rotates before backlashing and incurring a spike of pain in his eye. Deactivating his Sharingan, Sasuke wonders why the eyes rejected copying the jutsu. However, while Sasuke thought awakening the fox was a dishonorable way to win, so too does Naruto think it's a dishonorable win to use its chakra. Realizing the unfair advantage, Naruto separates his hands and deliberately breaks his concentration. The whips weaken before falling to the earth as shadows once more, shrinking back to Naruto's natural shadow as if nothing had happened. Above, Minato is smiling faintly. Impressed that Naruto had both the wherewithal to activate that chakra in controlled conditions, as well as relinquish it before the fox found a chink in the armor. He wonders if Gara can command his beast so deliberately. And of course, the Sanbi is in good hands. The fox mutters disappointment that Naruto is too cowardly to brandish that power any longer, and Naruto snarls at the insinuation. As Orochimaru taught him about the Beast Chakra and its affiliated Jutsu, Naruto also learned a lot about his mother by consequence. Orochimaru had no interest in gabbing about her day to day, but rather the cold facts about her proficiency as a Jinchuriki. Kushina was particularly skilled at utilizing this Beast Chakra, but that doesn't mean Naruto can't be just as good. In order to handle the Beast Chakra, Naruto needs to learn fear. He needs to find its source for him. He needs to master it so that he can decide when he feels it and when he doesn't. Naruto may not like the prospect of it, but should the Land of Earth make major offensive headways and the leaf needs time to regroup, Naruto needs to be able to release the fox at a moment's notice. He may not have control of the fox yet, but releasing it as some brutal savage on the battlefield can literally change a losing side to a winning side. Controlling the beast will come when he's older, but releasing it is still very much within his capacity to master. If he can master releasing the fox, then he can master holding the fox. It's a fundamental first step in learning to control the power. Gara of the Sand is known for releasing the beast often, but if left alone, he's been known to revert back to human form on his own. How can that happen? It's not an agreement with the One Tail, it's Gara mastering his own fear and controlling the valve to the beast's power. 
He can't control the beast when it's out and rampaging, but he can reliably narrow the flow of its power to the extent of sealing it back in himself. Forming the familiar bird seal once more, Naruto throws another handful of shuriken at Sasuke. Deflecting as usual and diving away, Sasuke is surprised by a sudden charge from Naruto as he swings down with his fists on top of each other. Instinctively raising his arms to block the strike, Naruto's windblade digs into Sasuke's arms. For Sasuke's whole life, his mom spent every morning at the Uzumaki household. He just didn't get it. She had her own kids. Why would she agree to spend half her time with someone else's kid? With Kushina killed by the fox, she felt no other recourse than to help raise baby Naruto when Minato simply could not spare the time to do so. But as Naruto got older and more independent, Sasuke was sure his mom would return to be a full-time parent for him and Itachi. But she didn't. She started bringing Sasuke with her, but he didn't want to spend time with the kid who was grabbing all of his mom's attention. Sasuke already had an unbeatable brother who won all of his dad's attention. Now the Hokage's son was taking attention away from him with his mom. He was already the Jinchuriki and son of the Hokage. They could have any number of people help with raising him. Why did it have to be his mom? None the wiser, Naruto held no animosity towards Sasuke, but Sasuke developed a lot of resentment from a young age towards Naruto. He'd gotten over most of that now, but sometimes the way Naruto looked at him spiked a roar of anger. Though initially bored by Naruto's basic skill set, Sasuke is now glad to have survived the diversity of Jutsu. Both his arms are bleeding now, but Sasuke uses this as an opportunity for a very particular Jutsu. Summoning Jutsu. Popping from a cloud of smoke, a very small Ketsuyu appears. Sasuke figures as much, tired as he was. Tsunade up above chuckles at the small size of Katsuyu, but it was exactly the right call following that wind blade. She looks at Orochimaru and asks him if he taught that to Naruto. He shrugs and insists it's a trick from Minato. Though Winjutsu would be easy to teach, it's too pedestrian for a boy of Naruto's magnitude. Someone with as much chakra as him can learn anything. Why constrict him to the basics? Sasuke asks Katsuyu not for offense, but defense and heal his arms. Meanwhile, he'll evade Naruto's strikes and protect her from harm while she works. She warns Sasuke that even in his condition, she'll still need to use his chakra to close the wounds. Agreeing to her conditions, Sasuke watches Naruto carefully. He's not low on chakra yet, simply injured. If he needed to, he could still conjure a boulder with his Sharingan. But that would only keep Naruto at bay for, what, a few seconds? And Katsuyu might need a minute. Unexpectedly for Naruto, Sasuke charges in and throws several kicks. When Naruto counters, Sasuke dodges, utilizing his head and body to push Naruto around and slow his offense. It's a simple matter of better technique that Sasuke manages to stay in the fight. Whenever Naruto tries to stop Taijutsu to weave a jutsu, Sasuke's in his face with further pressure. Not much damage is being dealt to either side during this time, which causes frustrated stirrings from the fox. He repeatedly demands that Naruto be more aggressive, this time willfully feeding its chakra into him. Out from Naruto's shadow, a thick arm reaches as Naruto's hands clap together. This isn't a trick Orochimaru taught him. The fox must be doing things on its own. Catching Sasuke around the torso, the arm grips him and holds him in the air. No! The brat can't do anything! Finish this stupidity! The fox growls angrily. Wheezing from the grip, Sasuke ekes out a confession. He tells Naruto that his mom spent half her time with him. So what little time he had with his parents? Half of that time with his mom was lost. Concentration interrupted by the surprising news, Naruto tells Sasuke that he had no mother at all. Mikoto was what kept him grounded while the rest of the village resented him. Mikoto had more reason than nearly anyone else to dislike Naruto, yet she loved him as if he were her own anyway. She was such a huge anchor for Naruto when even his dad couldn't spare time to raise him. Furthermore, Naruto wasn't demanding that she visit. She did so out of her own free will. I mean, their moms were best friends. Mimicking Sasuke's flying knee that he had attempted on Rock Lee, Naruto successfully hits the still-held Sasuke, knocking the wind out of him. 
As Sasuke struggles for breath, the grip strengthens and robs him of all breath, and he falls unconscious. Iruka calls the match, telling Naruto to release the shadowy grip, but Naruto realizes that he released the connection before the kick. The fox is somehow maintaining control of this one? Squeezing his eyes shut, Naruto tells the fox to release Sasuke, but gets no answer. The Uzumaki told him that the fox wouldn't have the free will to take control, unless Naruto had a spike of fear. Even though he doesn't know how he conjured it, this tendril holding Sasuke was a product of Naruto's effort, not the fox's. Running to the base of the tendril, Naruto focuses up, claps his hands together, and tries to will it away. The tendril wavers slightly, enough to drop Sasuke, but maintains its form. Landing beside Naruto, Orochimaru tells him to release the jutsu, but Naruto doesn't know where to start. In the very few times he has used the bestial techniques, the fox's chakra has been with him, but right now he can't feel it, and Naruto doesn't know how to do this alone. Orochimaru tells him that for as long as the tendril is out, it will continually pull from his chakra. The only reason he can't feel the strain is because of his unheard of chakra reserves. But sooner or later, he too will feel the strain, and it will be only harder than to relinquish it. Making Naruto keep his stance, Orochimaru commands him to focus on what he was thinking and feeling while conjuring the tendril. After one long, tense minute, Naruto finally manages to relinquish the tendril, stunned that he even knew how to do it in the first place. Problem solved, Orochimaru disappears from the arena, and Iruka repeats that Naruto won the match. As before, there is no clapping in the audience, just an eerie silence. Iruka looks around, wondering if he was calling the match loud enough. The silence is broken only by Minato's clapping, which slowly spurs everyone else to then start clapping. Naruto looks up at the crowd with disappointment. He's made huge strides with the fox, and nobody could care less. As Sasuke regains consciousness, Naruto helps him up. Pushing Naruto off of him, Sasuke begins hobbling toward the medical rooms. It wasn't a mean push, but Naruto has somewhere else to be now. He looks up at the competitor's stand to see an annoyed Neji. Omoi is seemingly starstruck by the fight, but Naruto doesn't know why. Gara, meanwhile, is looking down at him with the same intensity as before the match. That's right, Naruto's next match is against another Jinchuriki. He's been fighting with this crazy handicap his whole life, but now he'll be fighting someone with that same advantage. And that's the end of today's episode. Next up is the Neji vs. Omoi fight. What a weird matchup that'll be. Again, this episode was more focused on the match itself, but I've obviously constructed an intertwined history between the two. I wanted there to be more to their relationship than simply having similar histories. We can't be told that Mikoto and Kushina were friends, and then kill Kushina off and have Mikoto go back to normal life for the next seven years. Surely, Kushina's friends would be there for her child, right? It felt organic to me, and so I simply upgraded Mikoto's involvement. And that's not the end of this altered history either. More will be explored later. One thing about Canon's flashbacks that I really like is the reveal that actually Choji, Shikamaru, and Naruto were childhood pals. They did a lot of class ducking and the like together, but that's not inherently obvious in the present time. They get along, but you don't have this natural understanding that they're longtime friends until the flashback explains it to us. So this history with Mikoto helping Naruto in his early life versus Naruto helping Sasuke in his later childhood hopefully bridges the gap on their relationship. They have in fact known each other for their whole lives, even though they've resented each other at different times for effectively the same reason. A lot of characters, Fugaku included, have so little presence in canon, so I aim to flesh out those a little bit. Having Hyuga Anbu, who are meant to guard Kushina wherever she goes and keep an eye on the fox, for example, is fleshing out what certain members of Anbu are doing even now. They're not just elite guards, though that's a function they also fulfill during these intense times. Finally, before we end today, I wanted to touch on Sasuke's showing in this match. It was never meant to be very bombastic. He was tired, and Naruto had a bunch of new tricks to try out. The Wind Blade and this new set of bestial techniques that he can semi-reliably use, just to name a few. With that in mind, know that Sasuke still has some tricks of his own that we haven't seen. The circumstances just weren't right. 
and you can bet Neji saw everything that was withheld. I'm not sure if I explained the bestial techniques exactly as I wanted them to be. While they'll be explored later, obviously, I do want to specify that the shadow style can be seen as a physical conduit for the fox to appear. It takes a lot of effort to physically manifest from nothing, but if you can operate through the form of shadow, then you can exert a lot more power in a much shorter period of time. Effectively like skipping a step. Anyway, that's all the information dumping for today. Look forward to Friday, where we'll finally have an episode after two weeks. The sky's the limit.